I mean, the truth is basically I was broke. It sounds a bit cliche, maybe, but I dropped out of uni. I didn't tell my parents about it. Long story short, this thing didn't work out just for various reasons. And so I was in debt, basically, because that's how I've been funding myself for a long period. Because, you know, you think you're going to make it like everyone. Yeah. And yeah, at one point I had to get a job. And so I thought like, what's, what do I know? What have I learned? And then, yeah, so Groupon was, was kind of logical. And I was not too excited to keep working on, with restaurants after that project had failed, to be honest, but um, I had a couple of interviews. And so I had a great manager who interviewed me and I thought, okay, like this, this makes sense. And yeah, so, so I was there for like a year. Landing a great job opportunity is sometimes very challenging. Breaking into tech and getting hired as a sales rep can be even harder. When I was applying to my first sales jobs, I also struggled with the unknown. What to expect, what the tech industry was like, and how do I break in? After years of being an SDR myself, I've decided to build something I wish I had in the beginning. My name is Stefan, and in the SDR Hire podcast, I interview successful SDRs and salespeople who share their stories straight from the trenches. Learn how they got their first job offers, how they succeed every day in their roles, and what makes them stand out in their organizations. We all have what it takes. We just need someone to remind us of the opportunity and give us a better chance for success. Let's get your next SDR gig. Hey, hey, welcome back to the SDR Hire podcast. I'm your host, Stefan, and this is a place where you can learn from top producing salespeople what it's like working in tech sales, how do you break in, what do companies look for and how to succeed as an SDR all for free. And today I get to chat with Dennis Sprude. Dennis has always been an entrepreneurial type. After college, he started out in a newspaper company where he figured he had a knack for approaching people cold. Then he went and co-founded a company called Hayride. Following that, he landed an account executive role at Groupon, after which he worked with Unbabel and currently better up as a full cycle AE. I always see huge overlaps between SDRs and AEs on one hand and entrepreneurs on the other. And I feel Dennis is the perfect example of that. So Dennis, awesome to have you on the show. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Uh, anytime. So um, after following, following a post of mine that kind of went viral, um, you know, you and I started chatting and I just got very curious about your background. It's very unique and unusual for, uh, you know, it's not your typical SDR after college, then AE, then senior AE, if you know what I mean. And so uh, I really found your, your background and your exper experience very interesting. And what I would like to start with, maybe you can just say, like, what prompted you to go into uh, a newspaper company right after graduating? Or was it like after high school or, or like college? It was actually during high school. It was, right. uh, it was, it was an internship where everyone was told to work, uh, do an internship at a logistics company. And I thought it was a bit boring. And so I just thought like, what, what do I like? And um, so I had through some connection, uh, someone said, you want to go to a newspaper? And it's um, actually the biggest in Europe. It's, it's a tabloid newspaper. They're, they're, it's a little bit um, controversially seen by some people. And so I thought that that, that sounds interesting. Um, I always had a, a thing for writing and, and then that's how I ended up there and yeah I mean I get this question a lot about the um, like how do you go from being a writer to being a salesperson ultimately it's funny a lot of the the, the things that I learned there uh, I apply to this day and it's actually also what I what I preach when I when I give actually in every company I've worked in so far I've given trainings on that because I think it's such a fundamental um, skill to have and it made me also realize that sales is ultimately uh, a craft and it's not an art. And that was one of the big things I had, I learned uh, throughout the past couple of years is, is that you can, because a craft, you can actually learn it, you can hone it and improve it. And um, that, that was one of the biggest misconceptions I had about sales. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe how I, how I got into sales was that I, I was always curious since I was a, a child. And I mean, as long as I can remember, um, always asking questions, wanting to know everything. And ultimately, I didn't know such thing. I don't think anyone when they're five years old um, say to their parents, I want to be a salesperson. Um, so, so for the longest time, I had, I had these traits, which, which would be those of a salesperson or entrepreneur. But I didn't know there was such thing as a sales, sales role, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I was a little bit misplaced because some people wanted to become this or that. And I, I never knew where to take my talents. 
And so um, at one point then it happened, someone says you, you should go into sales. And so that that's kind of how, how the transition happened. But um, the reason why I didn't stick to the, to the writing alone was because I was missing this kind of adrenaline, this business kick, because um, I always like to work on projects and do things on the side. And uh, yeah, so ultimately that's how I, that's how I got, got into sales. There we go. And you actually uh, answered one of the questions that I did have, which is how did your newspaper experience help you or did it help you in your future roles as a salesperson? And hopefully we'll get into that a, a little bit deeper. Okay, so uh, right after newspaper or rather at some point after the newspaper thing, you started uh, your own company called Hayride. From what I could tell on your LinkedIn profile, it didn't really have a billion dollar exit. Um, so maybe you can kind of walk us through what happened there and like, what did you learn? And was it like, did you have any sales experience from what I could tell you, you were the salesperson on the team, uh, basically selling the product concept, whatever it was, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I mean, maybe take, uh, take you one step back to give some context to this, because like ultimately I'm, uh, originally I'm from Bremen from the south, from the, so, sorry, the, the north of Germany and I, and I moved to Berlin then. One thing that happened was when I was in high school, it's not even my LinkedIn, I had one of my friends who started his own t-shirt label. And that was like the first time ever that I met someone that I knew who was doing his own thing. And that was even a possibility because the way that schools train you, they say, you got to, you know, be a good guy, be a good student, and then become an employee. And I was so fascinated by that. And I thought, oh, let, let me help you. I want to be involved in this. And so, and so I was, and there was some like minor successes. This was like worn by some rap artists at Diddy's uh, Las Vegas party. There, there was some cool things there. And, and again, I, I kind of wore that hat. And so I think from then on, I was open to the possibility that, that this could happen. And then I, I thought at one point I would move to Berlin and see what's up, what's going on there. So in that sense, I, I really proactively wanted to get into the tech scene. Um, and, and then through some, some some networking events, I met some guy, an American guy, who who had this idea, and he's and he didn't speak German, so he asked me if I wanted to help him to to test this idea. He had promised his wife to never do a startup again because she would otherwise divorce, <laughs> and so he kind of blamed it on me. And he says, if it works out, it's it's, it's on you, and that's kind of what happened. So um, he had the idea that restaurants should uh, could as an as a marketing incentive basically um, offer taxi rides or and um, paying a part of that to customers if they ate at the restaurant and if they mm. drank wine there. And so what I was just doing, just knocking on doors of, of restaurants and, and um, yeah, that, that's how it started. But yeah, we didn't have a, a billion dollar exit. <laughs> I love I love the idea. What, uh, what, what year was that though? That was in 2014. Yeah, late 2014. Gotcha, a while ago, long before COVID stuff and all. Yeah, 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 exactly. Awesome. So you were basically going around the neighborhood, I mean, figuratively and just, or maybe even literally and just uh, knocking on doors and being like, hey, you know, we're offering this. Like, what was the model? What were you selling, actually? It was pretty pretty much comparable to the Groupon model. So you would, um, you know, you would get an our platform. And then if people came to the restaurant, spend money there, um, basically, we would get a cut. That was like the model. And then, and then actually also we worked, so we also worked in partnerships with the mobility companies, right? So we worked with BMW, Mercedes, talk, got, and it was crazy because I was 22 at the time. And I mean, that's when I learned about all about writing code emails, crafting them, and then getting in front of these people and sitting in these meeting rooms and not having any idea what I'm doing. But uh, I, I somehow ended up there and yeah, it was really cool. There we go. There we go. And you mentioned Groupon, basically after this project that I'm curious to learn how kind of how it ended. Um, you landed at Groupon as their account executive, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the truth is basically I, I was broke. I so I mean, it, it sounds a bit cliche. Maybe I wanted it to be like that, but I I dropped out of uni. I didn't tell my parents about it. Um, long story short, this thing didn't work out just, just for various reasons. And so I, I had I was in debt basically because that's how I've been funding myself for a long period because. You know, you think you're gonna make it like everyone, yeah. and yeah, at one point I had to get a job, and so I thought, like, what's what do I know? What have I learned? And and then, yeah, so so Groupon was was kind of logical, and I was not too excited to keep working on, with restaurants after that project had failed, to be honest. But um, I, actually, I had I had a couple of interviews, and it was the manager, and I think I don't know if you talked about this on LinkedIn, someone else the other day, 
that became like from that point on the most important thing for me to pick a role and so I had a great manager who, who interviewed me and I thought okay like this this makes sense and yeah so, so I was there for like a year nice do you remember I, I can assume that was quite a while ago, quite a while ago but um do you remember like what that in interview was like back at Groupon like yeah. did they have any SDRs or did you just just jump straight into a full cycle AE role what was that like yeah, it's it's more the latter because it's not it's not a it's not a SaaS company. It, so it's really it, it is a tech firm. They call themselves that, but really ultimately it's it's like an e-commerce platform where you know you so you 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 don't really separate between those. No. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so now you were there, Groupon. Uh, can you remember what the interview was like? Like, uh, did you go through several hoops, or was it just like a one conversation? Yeah, that one was actually pretty straightforward, to be honest. There was a couple runs, couple, just trying to think how many rounds it was. You know, it's like the usual, and talk to the manager, to the hiring manager, um, just, just kind of align and have a basic few things where they test you and some, some kind of assessment center. Um, yeah. yeah, it was pretty straightforward. Gotcha. So you were there for a year. What happened? Like, did you want to leave? Did you find Unbabble more appealing? Like, how did that transition happen? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I had a great time. Again, I had a great manager. I was doing pretty well from, you know, performance wise, but I just so felt that after I, that year was really to to lick my wounds, if you will, because like yeah. when the whole thing came to collapse, kind of the, the startup failed, I had a breakup with my girlfriend and, and it, everything came came together. It was pretty rough. And then, I, I mean, I literally moved into my parents' basement and I lived there for like a few months. So it's like all these cliches. So um I just felt okay, like let's let's you know lick my wounds, fix myself up, and then what do I want to do after that? And and, and so because so my ex girlfriend she was Portuguese, and so because of that I had some level of uh, connection already to that country, and I just felt like I wanted to move to a southern country, improve my Spanish maybe a bit, uh, like or like like a Latin country uh, at least. And yeah, so so I thought Portugal would would be really really cool. So you just picked up your stuff and went to Portugal. Oh uh, yeah, almost. I mean, I kind of did like like a scouting tour in in Europe and mm -hmm. uh, did like visit different cities. Try to also find like what what could be a good role for me. Uh, where, where they need a German speaking person, and um, yeah, so I got lucky in, in Lisbon that the and Unbabel was actually looking to to expand in Germany. Gotcha. Uh -huh, uh -huh, okay, so Unbabel is a Spanish Portuguese company. Yeah, so Unbabel is a Portuguese company. I mean, I think on LinkedIn it says American company, but I think that's because a lot of companies just, they just put it because I have also a big base there. And a lot of investors of Unbabel are based there. And so it kind of makes sense. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a SaaS company for what they do is really, it's a translation platform for customer service. And it's, it's really like a, like a Google Translate on steroids, tailored to, to companies and um, basically allowing them if you have you know customer support in different languages and you don't find enough agents, uh, mm -hmm. You can then um, translate it, tailored to every company, human reviewed, actually, so it's native level quality almost, and um, can actually do that at scale. So that's what I was selling then to companies. Really cool. So what was the, who was the, the ICP, the target persona that was like a uh, VP of customer success or was it somebody that was like more of a localization decision maker? Uh, like who? Yeah, it's a good, no, it's a good point. Um, it was like, so it was the buyers were actually, customers, like I said, customer service leaders, so directors, VP, whatever you want. Some, sometimes it was COOs because they, they own their piece, right. yeah. but really those, yeah. Nice. Sounds like a fun adventure. You were there for quite, quite a while, right? Three and a half years, yeah. Well, pretty good. So you were in Portugal uh, in Lisbon uh, the whole the whole time? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay, awesome. And you got like promoted, I don't know how many times over there, a couple of times at least. Hey there. I wanted to let you in on a couple of additional resources available other than the podcast and the social media content. So I recently started a newsletter where I break down the best pieces of advice from the podcast about getting hired, how to be a top performing sales rep into actionable nuggets that you can apply literally as soon as you read them. And in addition, if you're currently looking for an SDR role, you can fill out a form to let me know and I'll do my best to help put you in front of tech companies hiring for SDRs. All right, back to the show. Uh, yeah, so I started out actually as a as an enterprise AE or as an AE, then enterprise AE, and then I, and I became a sales manager. And I say you had AEs under you, right? Yeah, exactly. So we, we actually also had for, for a certain amount of time, we even, I even managed SDRs, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then at one point I also managed junior A's, yeah. That sounds sweet. So you were basically a full cycle this whole time. AE, right? Yeah, I, I was kind of, if you want to have a football analogy, I was basically a, a player coach for, so, so I was still uh, like, like still an IC, but then also managing. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Is that kind of where you really nailed the craft of cold emails and, and the whole like sales development thing? Or was it already a part of your, uh, you know, uh, part of your like weapon stack? No, it's, it's a good question, actually. So I think what happened is I kind of rediscovered that I had all of these skills, mm. but I never transferred them to my sales role for, yeah. for at least for a while. But then, the, so the guy that trained me, the guy that mentored me, the uh, American I worked with for, for the startup, he was really um, all about this. Like he, he taught me, like he gave me all these sales books to read and predictable revenue and all those types of things. And so he really made an art out of it. And so he taught me a lot about it. But it was really, yeah, I, would, I would probably say at that point, just because you realize, you know, you kind of tweak, you play with it, and you see what lands and what doesn't. And, and then you realize you don't like reading long emails. And, and so that really became my thing in particular there. Yeah. But I have even, I was looking at this recently, it's in German, but like I gave a training even at Groupon uh, on business writing and on the potential of it. It, was, it didn't make so much sense there because that's really like very phone heavy when you call restaurants and all these places. It's not so much written emails. But um, despite of that, I, I still, yeah, even there, I already did it. Yeah, I would argue that, you know, even all scripts and like the way you pitch over the phone is more or less the same thing as copywriting, because it's basically relaying the message. Now, whether it's in written form or verbally, it doesn't really matter because the the thing, you know, in the back end is actually the message that you're trying to show and tell right which is the essence of copywriting in a in a manner of speaking so um would you call yourself more of a, a copywriting uh, type of seller or or more of a like a phone guy well if i look at my numbers it's probably like 80 or 90 percent of my meetings that i also still generate myself come from emails gotcha and, gotcha. and well, that's but, impressive yeah but i think it's important to mention because i think that number might suggest that i don't like calling people uh, which is not true. Like I, I do that. I enjoy that. I think you should really play across the board, um, all kind of channels. Um, it's just so that, oh, by the way, like a lot of times you don't actually have a number uh, of someone. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's one thing. But yeah, it's definitely why I feel at home in, in the written channels. And I think just to what you just said about like the, the way I always position it is that it's not so much about making it look beautiful. What, it's, what it helps you, and there's tons of people that say, said this before me, the benefit of writing is that it helps you how to structure your thinking. And I think that's like the most, right? Like to what you just said, like, so if I've kind of sat down on, a, on, a, on an empty paper and I, and I wrote, laid it out, structured out my, my logic, if I then apply it in my, in my, in my verbalized form, it's, it's going to be much more smooth, much more on point, more concise. And so, of course, then you also carry that into the meetings that you have and so on and so forth. There we go. I agree totally. Um, and I think, I mean, you just mentioned something. Uh, it's sometimes hard to find phone numbers for folks, especially in EMEA, for example, I remember back when uh, I was selling both like to the US and to the EMEA and like in the US, you can more or less find everybody's phone number using this or that tool. So it's kind of easy, but for Europe, it's it was extremely hard. And like one of the, because we were selling outsourced like SDRs and outsourced like data, gatherers whatever uh, we call them market research associates and when i was selling that like the main value prop was hey obviously you, you know you're using zoom info for the us but like you know how the data quality for the european guys like how hard is it to find their phone numbers and i can assume that's the same thing like uh, you're selling into the da area right mostly yeah yeah, yeah. so is it, is it like that like very hard to find correct phone numbers yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think Germans in particular are known for, and again, that there's a that there's a historic reason for it, like why Germans are very cautious of of their mm -hmm. private data. I mean, there's a good reason for it, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely a challenge. And I think uh, the best thing that actually happens, to be honest, is if 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 you get an out of office message from someone, and then they say, "Please call me." Of course, I don't call them on the holiday, but that's one way to do it. But uh, yeah, it it is it is pretty challenging. I think. What's cool is if you sell into the enterprise, which I do, and you you sell to very senior people, at one point, they're going to have uh, executive assistants. 
and they will usually have like a really proper signature and so you can call them and but kind of get your way in that way but but it's tough still do you have do you have a secret uh secret sauce for those gatekeepers executive assistants and all <laughs> yes I, I mean yeah there, there, there's two there's two answers to that question so so there was we did have that one answer when i was back in groupon and they had a trick and they had a trick what you're smiling they had the trick was to say to basically overwhelm them because they didn't want to do anything wrong so what you would say is you would someone said if they were not the owner of the restaurant or whatever they that you would say oh I, I'm, i'm here to talk about the pro i want to talk about the prices for the project And so, like nobody wanted to think, oh, okay. And it's not really to 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 you know to conceive people, but really just um, you know to, to just like get over that hurdle. But right now, honestly, I would say just be like very genuine. And I, I think I have talked about this a few times. People don't utilize executive assistants enough, in my view. Like I think what happens is they reach out to these people and then they get an email back. Uh, if you're lucky. Because I get so many, and it's a polite email, and they say, "Look, we're not interested for now." I think a lot of people it's, who I talk to, they leave it there, leave it at that. And I think what I always do is I, I immediately, you know, call them back, I thank them, and I say, you know, it's just quick and easy to speak on the phone. And you're going to get a lot of intel that way. Maybe they're not going to put you through, but uh, you start developing their trust, and you you're being polite, you're being respectful, and that's actually helped me get in front of, I mean, like, get meetings with very very senior people. That's right. I love this because I've been an executive assistant. I know what uh, inbox looks like and what I was tasked with. And basically it's just like a tri triage, right? You're just looking at things and seeing, okay, does this matter? Does this not matter? However, I think that you're very right because whenever I was, and this was, that's obviously usually a junior role, more or less, like I'm not really in charge of anything. I'm just kind of funneling things through, through, but if I, come across something that might be important but i don't know i'm gonna forward it and see what happens and i think that's a good yeah. uh strategy that you mentioned which is like basically overwhelming well me in that case with just like oh shit, i don't want to screw up right so mm, i'm gonna just tell my executive about this and see what happens um and the other thing is i probably as an executive assistant i know so much that like, uh, you know, a nice word, a cool conversation can open a lot of doors and give you a lot of intel. So that's a, that's a very cool insight. Um, what's your experience with uh, executive assistants? Like, is it more often in Europe or more often in the US or is it like the same? And I'm asking these questions because I usually have US folks and this is a unique mm -hmm. opportunity to chat about, you know, about European things. Yeah, I mean, you mean if you, if you have, if, if they usually, have executive assistants if they get back to you what, yeah. what are you, what are you yeah, yeah yeah more or less like yeah I, I think as soon as you get to a, a c-suite for sure sometimes svp level they might they might have them uh sometimes they also share an, an executive assistant but uh, at, as soon as you get to the c-level for sure yeah nice anything uh interesting that you would like to share regarding the differences between us and EMEA? obviously we saw it's a popular topic So, so you mean the, the general difference or like on that topic for the EAs? No, in general, in general, like some of I your know. observations or something. Yeah, no, no, 100%. Um, it's kind of interesting because work-wise, I've mostly been working at either for US companies or with a lot of Americans. So like there was always a connection. And I feel like culturally, I'm more, every all my learnings, everything I, I, I pick up uh, is really coming from US culture uh, when it comes to selling. But the one thing i've really noticed is when it comes to outreach and i think it was the that, that was the post that you and i connected on which was about cadences right and like how often do you actually <laughs> contact someone and, and that's like that's like the biggest biggest distinction is and that's by the way the same that i that i play back to uh, my american management management when i say that like, guys culturally this is different here you cannot email someone eight or nine or ten times and just call them up every two or three days like that's going to be harassment you're going to be blocked and, and that's it you, you burned the bridge And I think like American culture is like very different. I think it's also more, I don't know if you also said this, like it's more phone heavy. It's really the more, yeah. more cold calling, like you said about the numbers. And here's really more, because even if you do cold calling here, you will have people who will say like, how do you get my number? And I think in America, it's way more co common for people to also just take a cold call or like to be cold called. And it's, it's more like, okay, but here's really got to be very, in particular in the enterprise space. So if you have, 
Again, at Groupon, it's very different. You have hundreds of restaurants and local businesses. Really doesn't matter. You have a few good ones. You don't want to burn those. But really, if you have, in my case, I have now maybe 40, 50 accounts, maybe even less that I really, really spend time on. And so you only have so many shots. It's a, it's a big company, but you only have so many shots and you want to make yeah. sure you get that right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. This was very insightful. Um, okay, so well, can you can you explain? So you spent three and a half years in Portugal with uh, Unbabble. And what happened then? So you transitioned to Better Up, Better Up, right? That's the name of the Better company. Better Up, yeah. 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 So what's that all about? Um, what's the company about? What was the transition like? Yeah, for sure. So I think better up. Oh, let, 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 how do I tell the story? I think what happened in parallel to my sales career is is what how, what what this experience of of the failed startup did with me. Because the truth is, it really it, it, like mentally, spiritually, it really had had a big impact on me for like a while, as you can imagine. And so it was the first time that I learned about you know therapy and all these types of things. And ultimately, what I realized. And is that it gave me so much that I just kept at it, even though I've even though I had solved a few different things. So I started working with a coach. I mean, I live in Berlin in the center. And so, you know, at one point you get involved with these meditation groups, and those types of things. That was like six, six, seven years ago. I'm a big Beatles fan as well. So it all kind of came together at one point. I read the Steve Jobs biography at one point, like 10 years ago. So, so it all came together. And so I started working with a coach. And even while I was in Portugal, I, I kept working with that woman uh, via, via telephone. And I saw the huge potential that it had for my performance. And what happened is eventually at, at, at Anbaba, I became best performing AE. I did almost like 20% of the revenue by the time I left. And um, I got asked about this, like, okay, what happened? Like the kind of trajectory, how, how did it happen? From, from ha never having sought in SaaS before to really doing so well in the end. And I was saying, guys, it's mostly because of this. It's, it's because I, I realized that by working on stuff that's not related to sales, it, it ultimately is going to contribute to how you perform. What happened also then at the same time was that I had started having physical issues for a while, um, pr pretty pretty uh, rough. And, and so I had a, a use basically my sales and entrepreneurial mindset to, to get over those, like finding the right doctors and doing the right uh, treatments. And so all of that combined, I thought, that ultimately unlocked the performance improvement and the well-being and, and the resilience. And again, people people thought I was joking when I said that because I thought like that that's okay. Like, tell me what, what what's really the, the trick there? And I said like, no, like that's really it. And at one point, I really started thinking about how can you bring this to other people. And so, at, at what I did at Unbearable is I started an interview series where I interviewed a dream coach, my biological dentist different kind of people, like kind of democratizing some of this knowledge that I had gathered. And I started being part of a well-being initiative with our uh, VP people, all those types of things. And I, at one point I thought like, there's gotta be something like that for employees, like they, you, how you can scale it. I didn't know better have existed at the time, but at one point I did. And that's when I thought, okay, like th this is it, this is the moment. Um, and so I, I was really, what, what better up is really all about is, is to, to, to exactly what I just said, to, to democratize the, the uh, giving people more purpose, clarity, and passion um, with coaching still being the main vehicle, digital coaching. Like that's how it started almost 10 years ago um, because the founders were looking at like, okay, like usually this is only offered to top executives, but not everyone else. So that was one aspect of it. But then the other part, that, that's what I really found, found the most appealing is what I just talked about, this holistic approach to, to, to what they call the whole person approach, right? So like, because you don't, when you come to work, it's not just, you know, Stefan in, in your role, but it's also Stefan, the human who has different topics going, like different things um, that, that, that you can work on, that you can improve on, uh, like, like resilience, social connection, uh, feeling, yeah. feeling included, all of that. And, and that really appealed to me. And, and so I thought, okay, like now is the time I've done, uh, kind of done my thing at, at, at Unbearable. I had a great time there, still got a lot of friends. Um, but I felt like now it's, it's time to do something something new because I'm also again curious, and nice. th I was so personally con connected to this to this mission that I felt even at one point when I was doing the interviews, which were really intense, I gotta say, but that I felt it sounded memorized what I told people. I said like this is not memorized, like this is true. Um, I, I've been thinking about this for a long, long time. I think there's this quote from the the found you know the McDonald's movie, the founder. We listen to this motivational tapes and it's and it's like a man is what he thinks about all day long. 
like, like that's what it was for me uh even before so yeah and, and now I'm, i've been doing this for one year and it's, it's super super exciting oh man it sounds it's inspiring very much um okay two questions so one is um okay I, I, let me let me put it like this so i can assume that you didn't really have a big of a a big problem getting in obviously you're very passionate about it and like i think it's one of those things when you just know you're gonna get in where you just know you can just crush it you're not even like it's not a possibility to not get in i can assume it was something like that with you but i am curious uh, like is it was it like that um and what was the the interview process like so how many steps uh what was your onboarding like and such yeah yeah Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up the first question in a little bit for something else. But basically, to to your main question, it, it, it definitely wasn't easy to get in. It was very tough mm. because there. So well, th th there's two components to it. One of one is for sure. It's, it's like a almost built valued five billion dollars uh, now. It's like it's a, it's a really fast paced company. So like they have really smart people in there, and so they they want to they they, they want to bring on smart people. So it definitely wasn't like a walk in the park. It was really uh, a lot of interviews that I did, very challenging. Like they really make you think and they really want to see like, uh, are you on your edge and can you do this? But what you write about is the fact, and I've been told this over and over again, people that were great performers, but didn't really align with the mission where they would be able to demonstrate it, not just repeat it, but like really demonstrate, okay, like, okay, like you say you, you believe in this mission, tell me, like, give me an example. Like they really were like investigating on that. And people that didn't have that, uh, they didn't make it into the company to this day. So I, I think in that sense, you're right. It, it helped me quite a bit that I could kind of show how much I related to that to that mission and still do. Got it. I think that's a very good thing in my mind, especially like being able to weed out people who, even though they're potentially a good skill fit, are not a good cultural fit i think that's even more important skill you can learn cultural fit it's just it's, it's not gonna turn out well so i think that's a very good thing although i didn't want to kind of uh, downsize the the amount of effort needed to get in i can assume mm. it was it was tough um so what was it like so you so you mentioned a bunch of interviews um do they have sdrs like uh were you applying straight to the ae role what did that look like Hey everyone, I started at SDR Hire in the first place to help as many of you as I can to land your next job, become better at sales, and just help you propel your career. So if you're finding value in this content and you know somebody who would benefit from it, please share it with them. Tag them in a post, send them via text, share it wherever you share stuff with your community. And as always, all of this is completely free and it's here to help everyone succeed. So your recommendation goes a long way. Appreciate you and let's get back to the show. Yeah, yeah, so so finally, yes, yes, I do. Um, um, no, and, and I think <laughs> there we go. I, I'm, I'm joking, but I think you actually made a very good point because so what, what this and this is what I loved. Hmm. What Better Up is almost about philosophically. Our our CEO Alexi, su such a brilliant guy. Um, he once said that if you look at our company values, well-being and individual well-being, all those things, and performance do not exclude one another. Absolutely. And because I'll, I'll be honest with you, Stefan, like a lot of times when people hear about what I'm doing now, they think, oh, that's cute. Like you're, you, you know, you, you're giving, you're selling babysitters, you're giving babysitters to, to weak people. Like that's kind of still the perception of when people market. But the fact that it's really so connected. And again, that, that then re reflects in everything how the company is run. On one side, it's very much like, hey, be on your edge, performance, ownership, all those types of things. And it starts in the interview. And it goes all the way into like how the company is run. And that's why it's going, doing so well. But at the same time, they will, they're very genuine about the fact of really living what they're preaching. Right. And so like to your question about the onboarding and every, 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 everything from then on, this has been making sure that, that we live, for, that we practice what we actually sell and what we, what we try to achieve. And so one of the things that he did, I remember when he was, we have one, one uh, we call them high impact behaviors. And one of them is actually to do less to live more. Um, so that people don't burn out and rather work on the right things. And, and the company as a whole is doing that. The leadership is doing that, which is super inspiring, where they say there's certain things we're not going to invest in now, we're not going to do now, we're very selective about it. And it, it trickles down all the way to how we should run our day, day to day. And so one of the things is like, if there's certain meetings that don't make sense for you to attend, be polite or kind about it, but then 
decline and explain like for now, you know, I don't think so. So those types of things really also helping you to, to reduce the chance that you might burn out all those, all those things. And, and that really is very nice to have both sides. Yeah, the, it's, it's making me think really, um, it's not really every day that you see a company actually uh, living the those values that they put on paper. I, I mean, that's a sad truth, but it's like that. Like companies usually put down cultural uh, traits on paper because somebody told them to, or like investors suggested it's a good, you know, uh, employer branding thing. But in this case, it's actually working. And that I think is one of the main reasons why Better App is such is doing so great um, because it's simply it, it shows that when you actually uh, perform um, in alignment with just feeling well, it, it just like it can't go bad. Like you can just go up and um, uh, and, and this really hits home for me, at least, because I've been through that, you know, hustle grind thing, culture, uh, especially, you know, American companies, they usually have that type of uh, mindset um, and and I know how unhealthy that is I've been I've been on therapy for the past couple of years and that's probably one of the top three things that I've done in, for my life that I kind of value the most which and like it's so healthy doing those things anyway I'm, I'm not gonna go too deep into the into the topic but it seems like it's working for you guys it's definitely working for you so uh, glad we could surface the topic. Cool. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what is your way of thinking about like, what, what is making you, you successful? I would say you are a very successful salesperson. Um, you have a pretty, uh, healthy following on social media as well. So like, I would, you know, say that you're a, a successful person. Like what do you, what would you describe as the main reason why that is? Well, f first of all, thank you. Uh, it's good that I managed to give that appearance. <laughs> um, I, I think it really goes back to what I was talking about, the curiosity part. I think that yeah. that's probably uh, number one. I made a post. I mean, I kind of feel bad quoting myself here, but it's more than because the way I think of my LinkedIn posting is almost like a, like a diary where I just drop, drop thoughts that I have. And so I have them there uh, and some people have happened to read them. But one of the things I realized um, is that the, the curiosity piece above everything else like, like the growth, I did an exercise with my better up coach in the beginning of the year. And what I did was we distilled my values, not in the sense of like honesty and those types of things, but also really like, what do I value in life? Mm -hmm. And the number one thing that came out of it was growth. Mm. Growth in the, of course, career aspect, but also then personal growth, learning and, and, and doing new things. And, and so that's always been... That's been the reason why I, I did always take new risks and did, because for example, like I, I had a very comfortable, I, I earned myself a very comfortable position at one point in Ababo and I thought, okay, like now I want to do the next, the next thing. And that's always a risk, right? Yeah. But um, so I think the curiosity, curiosity and growth. Um, and then the, I would say the persistence and level of detail. So I, I, again, going back to what I said about that, I always thought like sales is like an art. It's like one of these Hollywood movies where someone's standing on a, a, a chair, say, giving a big speech to a crowd. That's not sales. Like that, that's not enterprise or SaaS sales. Sales, SaaS is re uh, sales is really uh, the, doing the boring stuff and doing these consistently well over a long period. And by the way, I, I fail at so many things every day, like a lot of things not going well for me. But I think the persistence piece that I think is, is, is key. And if you combine it with curiosity, I think the curiosity has been, and I, now I'm quoting other people that have like kind of said why, what they think works for me, uh, that leads to thoughtfulness. It leads to being interested in people, as people, and then of course also using that for your work. And I think the third is really a uh, level of detail. Um, and again, that contributes to what would then be thoughtfulness, right? So being that that's got to be a point, and I, and I had to learn this myself as part of my coaching, by the way, in therapy. There's also a level to how how much detail you 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 apply, and and like in what areas is actually good to just do stuff and just move forward. But I think above else, making that effort, mm -hmm. I, I think if you have those kind of basics in place, they they can take you very far. Yeah. It 
comments around like every once in a few episodes, which is, you know, being curious, being consistent. Uh, and what was the third thing? It was basically detail. going detail. into details. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of, again, you know, going back to being curious, but then applying it to relationships, right? So going deeper into understanding the people you're talking with and, and all of that. I love that. I love that perspective. It, it does, it kind of, sh- I, I feel like, um, like if I didn't know you, if I didn't know that you were like, uh, you know, working with coaches, you know, working with therapists, I would actually assume you were because you, you sound like it, if that makes kind of sense. <laughs> um, there, there's a certain type of like way of talking when people actually, you know, go through that path of mm. understanding themselves thoughtfulness right so um I, I love this okay so um what would you then say to people who are trying to break in either as sdrs or aes like what would be your you know message to them yeah i, I have a very simple message that, that i tell to as many people as i can i think sales is if, if you have like like i was saying a growth mindset you love to learn and experience mm-hmm. sales is the school of life of course, I'm very biased. So, um, but I think the way I think of it is that there's so many things that you will learn along the way that you will um, not not just types of um, when I think about finance, politics, a big one, um, communication, project management. There's so much that goes into it. And I think mm-hmm. the much the, the 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 more even more beautiful thing about this is. You're going to be able, even let's just say you leave sales at one point, right? You say, you know what? I'm done. I've done it. And now I'm done. You're going to carry that with you into your life. So now when it comes to me, when I want to have doctor's appointments, guess what? I somehow almost managed to get an appointment very quickly. Not because I'm it's just like you, you just apply certain tricks, which other people haven't done, been in sales, just don't do. Everything that I do, even it, it sounds maybe exhausting as if I like always treat my life as a, as a one big sales project. That's not what I'm saying. But I think just like certain traits, following up with people, being thoughtful, um, keep like, and even one of my favorite topics without me digressing here, but that I also talk a lot about is it's so much sales. People can learn a lot from dating, dating books. That's mm-hmm. that also like some of my favorite sales books. Well, what, what I mean by that is I've learned so much from, from my work in sales it help, has, help, has helped me improve my relationships and actually being able to sit back and listen, to really listen and to, to talk to people, hear them out, what they want, what they, what, what they care about and, and all these little things. And of course, the other part, what I was saying, is like the perfect playing field for your personal development because it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring out the best and the worst in you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to put, so things are going very, very badly. It, it's going to show you, to, it's going to force you to kind of see like, what kind of person am I? Who do I want to be maybe? How, how to deal with this? How do I then treat people around me if things are not going well? And then the other thing is, if it goes very well, and by the way, I've been on both sides of the spectrum, on and off, right? The other one is then, if things go very well, you close the big deal, you feel like Jesus, you feel like you're walking on water. Of course you're not. But, but, you, but there, there's a temptation in that moment to think that. Mm-hmm. And so even then it's like, how do I treat people around me? Am I being grateful to those who help me? Uh, closest to you because you never do it alone all those types of things what happens when you suddenly earn a bit more money like what kind of bring because i because i realize money doesn't change you uh, yeah money does change you in the sense it makes you who you really are mm. right because then i think that what i realized the more people money the more money people have the less they depend on having to please others so they just act like they want to act and so i think there's all these kinds of temptations to then reflect and be self-conscious and yeah, so that's why I say to everyone, for me, it's a disgrace that this is not really taught a lot in, in schools, even universities, yeah. there is some that do it. But I, I mean, I studied communication management. I had marketing, I had all these types of things. We didn't have a thing on sales, which I think is, 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 is a shame because it's such a useful uh, thing, thing to hone. Definitely. A few things that you, you mentioned there, let's start with the education, like it's across the board. Like, the whole world is just screwed up in a way that schooling is either 
a stupid necessity or just a well-oiled business and a machine without actually teaching people anything. And that's kind of the two spectrums that I see uh, on the education side. And I just, I hate the fact that I've never had the chance to learn about entrepreneurship or sales or anything additional than your regular, you know, curriculum growing up. And yeah. you said this in the beginning of the, of the session, which is, you early on came across a friend who was doing something of his own and you were like, I want to be a part of this. So mm. it was, it was very relatable because I only realized that I can actually be an entrepreneur. It was like a couple of years ago. I was like, how come I never thought about this because yeah. I was never exposed to it. Right. So yeah, exactly. um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, the other thing that you, that you said is, uh, I can't remember. Okay. doesn't matter. Okay. Where, can, can, where... I say, can, I, can I just very yeah, quickly yeah. say one more thing? Cause I think you just made a great point. Um, so the entrepreneurial thing is the other thing, right? Where I was say, saying you learn so many things. So if I ever wanted to do my own thing again, like, like the lessons and the skills I've picked up there invaluable. The other thing is, and then, again, that's why I say that there is a book that a guy wrote called Daniel Daniel Pink, he wrote it. He was a speechwriter for uh, Al Gore, I think, at one point. He wrote a lot of books. And one is called To Sell as Human. And mm -hmm. what he was actually saying is that like, almost all of us are in sales in some form, in some, some capacity, right? Like if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, in a way that you, you, you got to sell your services, you got to, um, you know, make, make a transaction happen, happen in some form or like sell someone a treat and explain to them like why it makes sense using reason and logic to so all these kinds of things. The other thing that I also want to say, and then I'm closing in on this topic, it's also made me a better buyer. And I think this Ooh, is why I love this. Yeah. And, and, and this is so, so important. And, and what, what I realized is that first, when I was a buyer in the past, like we are all buyers of some form, right? I'm not even just talking about being like in a store, but like if you even have to do per, make bigger purchases, I've never negotiated before. I would never do that. Like all these types of things. And now, Every time, man, first thing I do is I negotiate. I see like, what can we do about this? And I even encourage people, I notice this, to, of course, in part, I'm now more able to afford more external services than I was before. But in a way, maybe it's confirmation bias, but I also enjoy this so much. I recently, uh, I'm, I'm going to move to a new apartment and I, and I hired an interior designer. I've never done that before. And, and mostly because I just realized I, I didn't want to spend the time and she, that person was very, like, it would save a lot of time. But then I was also studying them. It was so fascinating to see like how they're doing it, how they answer my questions and what kind of questions, what kind of emotions come up in me. And I realized like the trust piece and feeling that I, that, I, that that person knows what they're kind of talking about and try to guide me, how, how important that was for me. So, so I think again, like, like putting yourself in the position of a buyer and then, of course, also being skilled. And when someone tries to sell to me at one point, and they, they, I said, you can stop right there. I know what you're doing. It's not working. <laughs> right? And, and so this, this is an invaluable skill. Oh, I totally agree. And so, and like, being able to, like, I keep telling this to everybody who's trying to get a role, or like, whomever, friends or, or SDRs that I work with. It's like, you're selling yourself literally all the time. So especially when you go into you know interview sessions especially when you start interacting with hiring managers and managers in any way and then like always be like you know some people find it daunting some people are just like too introvert or whatever like i don't feel like selling myself i can't do that no like every time you speak you're selling yourself to somebody in a way, in a certain way, right? If it is to a hiring manager, then yeah, you're selling yourself, your services, you have a price, you can negotiate it, all of that. Um, so I, I think you brought that uh, extremely timely and um, it's such an important topic people miss out on. Um, but yeah, um, I, I love that you negotiated with your inter interior designer as, as, as well as just like uh, studying the way she, I am, uh, I'm assuming, was uh, selling it to you. Yeah. Um, and also also the other thing, I'm kind of trying to practice that with, uh, I'm buying a new car right now. So it's uh, it's funny to like, I mean, I think that actually is, is probably the best test that I can have. Um, just trying to, you know, negotiate to realize like, is this car really a good one? Or am I just being really sold very well?
Yeah, and and of course, I think the one mistake I made in the beginning, I was I would tell people I'm a salesperson. Now I don't say it. Now I act ah, stupid. Now I act stupid, and then <laughs> let them do it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay, okay. Now uh, this can go on for uh, quite a while. So let's just uh, start wrapping it up with uh, a few rapid fire questions, um, and then we can uh, we can uh, wrap it up. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, so, what would you say is uh, in your mind, best sales learning resource. Plural, plural is also an option. Yeah, I think I already kind of gave it away a little bit when I said like books and movies on on dating. Yeah. Uh, that, that that I think is a little bit like not not standard particular. I mean, I, I love um, just like I was saying, sales people learning from sales people who are not sales people. I think that's what yeah. it comes down to. So I love reading books on sports agents. I love uh, politics and investigative journalism, all these types of things, biographies of entrepreneurs. Um, anyone who's never, like, of course, they have the standard sales books, the go-to books, and they're great. You should read them. But I think on top of that, I love transferring that knowledge from these yeah. other seemingly unrelated fields. Yeah. yeah, such a good answer. Okay. Uh, what do you think is the best sales skill? Cognitive agility. Ooh, okay, let's let's just unwrap it a little bit. So basically, what I think is the 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 willingness or the ability to always iterate and not recycling yourself. Because what's going to happen is you got to be quick on your feet. That's going to you got you always got to adjust how you how you go about things. And as much as you should, should at the same time, I think that's a skill. Sticking to not always kind of bending when the, when the wind blows a bit uh, stronger, uh, like kind of sticking to your, uh, to to your principles. But at the same time, having a healthy level of wanting to iterate and, 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 and adjusting things and tweaking and kind of reflecting on it and, th and then ideally doing it very fast. I think that's the number one skill where I've noticed people's, for example, someone got lucky with one email to someone mm -hmm. and it was a terrible email and they still got a reply. And they're going to say then, oh, okay, that works. I don't have to change anything. Now, it works today. It's not going to work tomorrow. So, so I think that ability that you don't recycle yourself and you're willing to basically throw everything out and there's a lot of ego attachment to it so that makes it mm -hmm. tough but doing that i think it's going to help you uh, the most mm. i love this okay what do you think like who is or or who are the best sales creators to follow yeah th there is a lot there is a lot which i love because they are so openly sharing their their knowledge I think if I had to look at someone first for SDRs, who I think talks a lot about SDRs and kind of uh, gives advice, is a guy called Kyle Coleman. You probably know him. Um, yeah. He's an SVP at a company called Clary. There is a guy that I really fell in love with in the sense of, you know, from, from a sales perspective. It's a guy called Nate Nasrallah. Yeah. Like, you see yeah. smiling. Yeah. So, yeah. so he is absolutely incredible the, the way he goes. Um, yeah, then, then, then there's a few other ones, but I think those are like the, the two that I really love. Amazing. Um, what is your favorite SDR channel? Although obviously I think we, we answered that one. I think so, yeah, I, I, I would yeah. say so, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, in that case, like, what what is your, uh, I usually ask this about a cold call, but like, what is your favorite cold email opener or mm -hmm. like an icebreaker that you love using? I think it's pretty much the same for both. Um, it's it's really kind of stating any some kind of fact. So meaning, hey, you're you're in that position, you're doing this, or you 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 talk. Of course, the, the better version of this would be, hey, you gave this interview and you talked about this, or your company is doing X Y Z. And I mean, that's really where you show someone, hey, I've been actually done my research. That's and right. at the same time, at the same time, you actually set a context. As to like, why do you call me? Because that's like the first thing, right? Like, wh why do you call me? Why do you contact me? It's like, no, because you do this or you said this, and then you kind of build on that. Okay, I love this. Um, what is your actually? What is your favorite call to action that you prefer using? Very, very simple. Not, not, nothing very special. It's really the the an open ended question. Uh, and then, sorry, it's 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 a question if they, if they, if they would be interested to learn more. Interesting. I, I, question. Well, but I, but I think it's important because what I see a lot is people, I think the worst, and I talked to a lot of buyers about this, and they hate it, is if you, if you say, hey, let's talk next week, book a slot here. Because it's, it's very, 
it's okay. kind of assuming that, that you kind of dictate it and you don't. Got it. Right? Got so, it. so ask them for that first, putting the a person in kind of data side. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally. I, I don't understand why people use that those types of call to actions anymore, but it's it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, unwrap it sometime. Um, and for for the end, so what is your favorite tech sales acronym? We all know it. You know, SAS is full of acronyms. So uh, yeah, I mean, of course you have the the, the medic, the band. I mean, th there are so many. I think ultimately what people do is they, they come up with something just to sell a book. And then they, <laughs> so right. So I'll I'll tell you this. Like even the stuff that I learned. The first ones that I ever learned was a marketing class in college, which was the AIDA one. Nice. Even even that can be relevant. So I think there's like it's almost like a like a buffet you, where you pick something from every everywhere. I think there's some to all of these. Even like the ABC one, which I think is like <laughs> kind of old school. There are some good things in it, and you know you kind of shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater thing. So yeah, I think of it as a menu. Each one of them have have useful things. That is cool. Okay, and for for the listeners, uh, just go and Google what ABC means in uh, in sales. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this was awesome. I wish we could talk for another hour. Hopefully, we'll get to meet uh, at some point. I really enjoyed this conversation, man. Uh, I really appreciate you for coming on. I hope our audience will love it as much as I did. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll uh, I'll see you around. Thank you so much, Stefan. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for tuning in to the SDR Hire podcast, the only podcast exclusively focused on SDRs where successful salespeople share about their hiring stories and sales adventures straight from the trenches. If you found this useful, go ahead and share it with someone else you know is trying to break into tech or land their next SDR gig. You can find SDR Hire on all major podcast platforms as well as YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and catch you in the next episode.